when I was in college, um, I, uh, uh, you know, especially when you first go to college, it's that crazy first semester, just excited to be at the dorm and new friends and roommates. And um, every month, the first semester, I still remember, this is 1992, long time ago. Um, uh, we were, we will be asleep in the dorm, in our dorms, and around 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, there will be this loud, loud horn that at the beginning I didn't know what it was. All that I knew is that he would woke me up on Saturday about 7.30 in the morning. And um, later I found out that it was a city um, alarm that went off, or is supposed to go off, when you go through um, uh, weather conditions and things like that. So um, signage, signs are important. Uh, I remember going through one storm, and this is Texas, a um, small country town where I went to school. And um, so I'm glad for those things. But in today's culture, things have changed. Uh, it, it, this is a screenshot from my phone from yesterday. I don't know if you can see the yesterday or maybe on top. But it's 8.39 p.m. And the signage looks like this. This is my phone. It came on my phone. It says, a large storm with the possibility of heavy rain and very strong winds is moving into the Abilene area. Um, the bad news, I guess the good news is that you get a warning. The bad news is that it's for Abilene, it's not for us, so it's just West Texas. But I was reminded of this little signage how this is important, especially when you are facing a storm. When I went through the storm back in, uh, back in my college days, uh, we literally went to Walmart. It's a small community, so Walmart was a highlight you know, of our day, going to Walmart. Um, and we went to Walmart, and I still remember. We went inside Walmart. And for about an hour and a half, we were inside. And I remember, we remember a lot of rain, but we didn't know that it was, a, it was some sort of a hurricane that came by and took a lot of, this is, this is East Texas, a lot of pine trees came down. But uh, back then, there was, no, there was no phones, there was no alerts like that, except the, the, the loud horn. See, what we're doing for the next three months, because this is our first Sunday um, to launch this series of World Mandate, um, this is the emphasis that we make as a church on missions. In the summer, we focus on going and giving and uh, basically rekindle, retake on the conversation of why we exist as a church. And part of this uh, ban mandate is for us to convey a message. There are some places around the world where it's raining and there's some storms going on. Uh, one of them, obviously, pretty obvious, is England. Do you guys know what's going on in England? It's a sad deal. It's a, it's a bad situation. Um, the Philippines, a uh, uh, pastor friend of mine, uh, with his team uh, from one of the churches in town, just traveled to the Philippines this week. And there have been some terrorist attacks as well. So, so the message that we convey is extremely important. The world mandate is about a message. Now, if you were here with us previously, we finished a series for about two months um, on daring faith. And daring faith was basically the rediscovering of the faith of Jesus. Not our faith, but the faith of Jesus and how we emulate that faith. Um, we finish our conversation on daring faith, basically speaking of the message, but we said that the message of the gospel is not simply words that Jesus spoke, but the message is a person. So I want to just put it before you uh, this morning how important this message is, because going, or this emphasis on missions, has to do with a message that is the words of Jesus and is made also of the person of Jesus. Um, I want to make sure that we also understand the clarity of this message. See, when you read the book of Acts, and this is where we are going to be navigating for three months, uh, the writer of Acts uh, begins on verse uh, 42, uh, chapter 10, by saying he commanded. Who commanded? Jesus commanded. Jesus commanded. The one that he is the message. He is the incarnation of the message. He commanded us, community, communal, to do what? It's a command. You don't have a choice. I will even argue this, that if you're a Christian, you are preaching. It's just we're going to try to get, make sure that we're preaching the right thing. Does that make sense? Because if you are going through life right now and you're getting the wrong message, ooh, brother, that might be tragic. Does that make sense? Especially if you're in the middle of a storm. So hopefully when you do communicate the gospel, because you are communicating, if you're a Christian, you every single day, the way that you treat your wife, the way you raise your kids, the way you deal with finances, the way you deal with life as a whole, you are communicating a message. We're training one another. We're training people. We're training children. So, so the writer says, hey, we are commanded to preach. 
And we're commanded to preach to the people and to do what? To be a witness. We'll talk about it in just a minute, okay? That he, who's he? The one who commanded. That he is the one whom, not the church, not the government, but God appointed as a judge of the living and the dead. Now, this message, again, is extremely important for us because when you're going through a situation similar to um, England, when you wake up to the reality that your loved ones are gone, and not just that they're gone, but, okay, come on, just, you know, murder, um, just this, this uh, Islamic uh, movement or religion and the atrocities that are taking place, um, that is the moment where this message is going to be put into a test. It's going to be, uh, it's going to come uh, to the surface once you go through the valley of the shadow and death. And, and this morning, what I want us to understand and see is that one of the challenges for our governments, governments in general, whether it's Great Britain, whether there is someone like Germany, whether there is someone like Austria, or maybe the Philippines, or even someone, in this case, like France, but specifically the United States of America. The challenge with our governments and the threats that we're facing today in terrorism is that um, the, the driving force of this Islamic movement the Islamic community, the ISIS, the, 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 the radical Islam, what is, what is moving them towards this, what seems to be an unstoppable force, is a theological view. It's a religion. It's a concept of who God is to them. Now, the problem with that, here's the problem. The problem is that our government, our government leaders, they typically, and these countries that I'm giving you, our country is no exception, we are being led most of the time, and it's only going to go down in this region by men and women who are processing life through a non-religion worldview. We call this secular. So we're not here to talk about politics, but what we talk about in this place is that if this is the message and you are a person who is put in leadership, is placed on leader, in leadership, and you're supposed to face these this enemies, you're supposed to navigate the tragedy of the last few hours in England, and you have no concept, and you do not care, neither believe in God, and your enemy is driving by a God concept, I think you have a problem. Now, now with that being said, hear me say, hear me say this very clearly. The challenge that I'm seeing primarily, besides what I just explained, is that the role that the government plays in moments like this changes. And it changes from the God-given uh, 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 command or God-given authority that was given to the government uh, to the place that, if you think about it, biblically speaking, the government is here or exists to be a law enforcement, meaning to protect the sanctity of life. The government exists to have the sword and use the sword to protect us from enemies. So we are blessed to be in the most powerful nation in the world. We have the best military in the world for that. We are grateful. We are thankful. I hope and you're grateful for 9-11. When you dial 9-11 and you get a response, most countries around the world have none of that. Um, but in moments like this, when the message is compromised, government sometimes is perceived as an afterthought. Government seems to be uh, you know, embraced or seen as just completely tied up in nothing that they can do, the government can do. The, the tragedy also happens that in the culture that we live today, I feel sometimes that the church is perceived exactly like that. So on one hand, you have the government. On the other hand, you have the church. And, and I'm concerned because I'm, I'm hoping and I'm hopeful that this series of, uh, of the world mandate will help us to understand that the church was never a second thought. It was not an afterthought. It's not the plan B of God. The church from day one was commissioned to do this, commissioned and commanded to preach the gospel, to testify about the gospel, and the gospel is simply that this one individual by the name of Jesus has been appointed by the Father as a judge of the living and the dead. That is the gospel. And when this message is misunderstood or confused or watered down, then the roles of people or agencies or entities will, will struggle. And I'm hopeful that today we can get this conversation going on as a church. And this is where I, I'm glad that you guys are here. As a church, we are embracing this message clearly and head-on collision. We, we do not apologize for what we, we believe. We do not apologize for embracing the fullness of this gospel. 
And as a reminder, what I want to I want to just take you to for the next few minutes is to remind you of the people that we have commissioned as a church. Here are some of the pictures of the men and women. And when I say men and women, uh, to be honest with you, they are my children's age. So I doubled their age, which is very, very exciting because, you know, it seems to me that the ones going is the younger generation, which is great. Okay, but here you see pictures of where they are today, and they're serving in churches around America, Houston, Texas, Thailand, California. I mean, they're all over the place. We have a second batch, a second group of missionaries going in the next few weeks, and we're going to go to other places around the world and around the nation, from South Mexico to Germany uh, to uh, border cities as uh, Progreso. I mean, you guys will hear of those in the coming weeks. So we believe that for us to embrace this gospel, this message has to be given and presented through the local church. And for that as a pastor, I am internally grateful because we do that. Now, let me make one more parenthesis and then I'm going to take you into the passage that we're going to dissect in just a minute. Um, I want want to make sure that we understand this. Although this is great and these guys are doing an amazing job and I'm hearing from them, I'm talking to them, I'm texting with some of them, I want you to understand that as you leave this place in the next 40 minutes or so, 30 minutes, um, I want you to know that you are also a missionary. I I told you a while ago that when I look at the passage, uh, everyone is preaching. Everybody is testifying. It's just what kind of a preaching are we given? What kind of a message? That's the only question. Everybody's doing it, whether whether you like it or not. Again, because of behavior and the way we treat one another and things like that. Well, in, in this case, Paul, giving us a, a, a couple of verses in the book of Romans, he basically tells us this in chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, and this is why we are in this place. How then can they, who's they? The world. How can they, they call on the one they have not believed? How can they do that? And then here's the next question. And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? So they're not able to believe because... They don't know who to believe. And then they're not able to put their trust because they have not heard. And how can they hear without someone? So come back to this. Someone, here's a someone. Because they are going. They have gone. And they're gone. I mean, they're mostly their college. Well, all of them are college students. Okay. Uh, college age. And then they, they will hear um, until someone preaches to them. Once again, this preaching concept, this communication concept. So Paul closes on verse 16 and says, And how can anyone actually preach unless that person is, come on, is what? Is sent. In other words, this is a mandate that is divinely appointed by God. And and this is a mandate that is given in the context of community. So let me say this very, very, very clearly. There is tons of agencies that do what we're doing, meaning sending people. My heart's desire is for us to be the number one agency in South Texas sending people out. I'm all for everything that is happening around us. I'm all for denominational, you know, partnerships and networks, all that. But let's make sure that we are the ones sending. As it is written, he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I I just find this very kind of a contradiction of terms because the word beautiful and feet, typically they don't go together, right? I, I, I haven't met people with beautiful, well, except my wife. My wife has beautiful feet. But besides her, I, you know, none of my kids have beautiful feet. Don't tell them. But, you know, typically people have ugly feet, right? But apparently, when you bring the good news of the message, your feet are beautiful because you are bringing something bigger than, bigger than yourself. So, so what we're going to do for the next few uh, weeks, uh, actually three months, what we're going to do, and this is what I want you to think with me for a moment, it's... Um, how this movement of Jesus took place in the book of Acts. Uh, uh, Just to give you a framework, you have the book of Matthew, New Testament, the book of Mark, the book of Luke, and the book of John. So four Gospels. And these four Gospels finish, all of them, with the crucifixion and with the um, burial and resurrection of Jesus. And the fifth book, which is where we are, Acts, begins with what this four ended, which is basically this ends with the resurrection and then the ascension, going up to the Father. So when you think about our series this month, I want you to see how this took place. The gospel was embraced by this generation of men and women that witnessed Jesus. And they move from being a nationalistic, okay, 
ethnic-driven, um, egocentric, VIP mindset to what God had in mind from the beginning, which is a globalization. From day one, God spoke to Abraham and said, you are a Hebrew, you're not a Jew yet. You're not a Jewish community because you don't exist. Jews didn't exist. He speaks to this, to this non-Jewish guy that eventually becomes a Jewish guy, I guess, and he speaks to Abraham, Father Abraham, and tells him, even though your wife is barren and you both are up in age, you're old, I'm going to give you a child, but this child is going to bring forth a family. And this family is going to bring forth a nation. And this nation is going to be the vehicle that begins with a nationalistic ethnic, uh, uh, geographical kind of a boundaries, which is important, but that is what the purpose to move into the blessing and the rescuing and the redemption of the world. That's the reason. Now, all of that never happened until Jesus begins in the book of Acts and goes up to the Father. So if you are a Christian today, I, I want to remind you of this, that the reason why you are saved, if you are a Christian or a follower of Jesus, is for you to move from a natural-born taker into a natural-born giver. I'm going to say that again. The reason why you came to know Christ is so you can move from an individual, self-centered, narcissistic, me-first, to I'm willing to give everything within me that even though I was nationalistically or ethnically, I have my preferences and my inclinations. I understand that everything that I am, everything that I have ever experienced is for a bigger purpose. That is the background of the book of Acts. And that's how it all begins. Now, it's pretty obvious that for you to convey a message that transforms people, it needs to transform you first. Because here's, here's the irony of the story. The irony of the story is that if you study the first, I will say the first 200 to 300 years after the resurrection of Jesus, think about it. This nation, our beautiful USA, is about 270 plus years of existence. So think about the length of this nation in existence. If you study that frame uh, of time, in the history of the church, this people in the book of Acts, they were not primarily known by their theology, doctrine, belief system. One of the reasons is because the first 300 years of the church, there was the making of these doctrines. In other words, they didn't know exactly how to navigate the transformation in their hearts, that something has taken place in them, but they couldn't fully experience that or fully, fully explain that. What they were known for, and this is the beauty of what I'm saying, what the church of Jesus was primarily known in the first century was their generosity. They were just generous. And by generosity, I mean that they were committed to move from Judaism to embrace the Gentiles, to embrace the Romans, to embrace the nations. We're going to study some of the missionary journeys of Paul that moves outside of the Jewish community. But then they understood that if they were the seed of Abraham, if they were the seed, if they were from the lineage of this Jewish culture, through Jesus Christ, the circumcision or what makes you a Jew now moves into the spiritual realm. So now, instead of just going by ethnicity and a skin color, now I understand that we are a community that through, uh, through the last 2,000 years continues to grow because of the message of the gospel. So, so he, hear me say this. I am... I am not against the Jews. I obviously bless that nation. But look at me for a second. I, I just, I'm not for the Jews. I'm for the Jew. Is that a fair statement? I'm going to say that again. And I know this might sound controversial. And I hope you say it until the end of the movie. Uh, but, but just hear me say this. I think the Jewish community is a special community. They were the original vehicle to bring this salvation and the seed of Abraham, which is Jesus Christ. But at the end of the day, it's not about the Jewish community. It's about the one Jew that came from the community. Does that make sense? And this Jew, by the name of Jesus, is the Redeemer. So he is the one that makes this transformation from individualism to community. So for us to look at this world mandate, when you have billions of people in need of the gospel, when you have a nation, an entire nation, that as we speak, they're confused. 
They're mourning. They're, they experience the death of pain as the nation of Great Britain. We, it is a task that is going to require the church of Jesus Christ. And that's why we are here. So, so these people were transformed, and here are some of the evidences. Other thing that actually happened with them, and this is on your handouts, it has to do with them understanding that the kingdom of God was not a future thing, although it is. But the kingdom of God and the power of this kingdom is present. It was present in that moment. Now, now please, again, just, just a little bit of history, and this is important, because what we're going to look at next week, we're going to go into chapter 1 of the book of Acts. And chapter 1 is the ascension, is the moment that Jesus goes up to the Father. And right before he goes up to the Father, like physically, he's going to ascend. The Bible says that the disciples are going to ask him a question regarding this kingdom or this power. And this is what they say. This is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, would you, would you, or when would you restore the kingdom of Israel? Implying... We believe in you. We've seen you death. We, you had a great funeral. Coffee was great. We, we buried you. We prepared your body. Now we believe after 40 days of walking as a resurrected Christ, victorious, we believe you're the one. But before you go, just in case that we, I mean, I know the signal on the texting is going to, somewhere is going to, you know, the roaming is not going to work once you get to the heavens. So before you go. When would you restore the kingdom? Because Jesus, it doesn't look like restored. The Romans are still in charge. There's still a bunch of Roman crosses with a bunch of our cousins and nephews. And, 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 and my dad and my granddad has been crucified. So the kingdom is not being restored. Help us out when? Jesus responds. Chapter 1, verse 8. It is not for you to know the seasons or the times. But you will receive when the Holy Spirit shows up. And then he goes and says this, and you will be my witnesses to, come on, say it with me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world, the Great Commission. So, so here's the theory that I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to ask you to think for a moment. As a Jewish person, you translate the power of the kingdom of the God that you have always believed as the transformation of the physical condition of the people of God. And you are about to go and it hasn't happened. So when would you do that? And Jesus is saying, I have done it already. What you're asking for, they didn't know this, but what you're asking for is the consummation of the kingdom. But the kingdom has begun because the kingdom is within, is within you. The kingdom is, now you have moved from death into life, from darkness into light. Now you are my witnesses. So watch this, please. See, this transformation of the new kingdom that has already taken place and is in existence is what motivates churches like us to go to the nations. The challenge with this kingdom that we're describing and that we have experienced is a kingdom that literally what, what, what is going on is that the circumstances may not look like kingdom oriented. But here's what I want you to see is that it gives us the opportunity to refocus our attention. That instead of thinking, watch this please, instead of thinking that we are saved and our salvation, your salvation is the end, your salvation and my salvation, the gathering of men and women on a Sunday like this is means to an end. We love to meet on Sundays. But Sundays, Sunday doesn't rule over us. Sundays serves the church, not the church on Sundays. What does that mean? That our gathering has a bigger reason what's the reason here's the reason if you're saved why are you saved here's the reason if you have embraced the gospel why is it just to avoid hell is it just to get rid of the romans in this time in history no it's for you to be the incarnation for us to be the representation of the power of an invisible kingdom that in due time will become visible does that make sense and when I say the invisible kingdom, please look at me. I'm talking about that this kingdom has been introduced by the Lamb of God. That when he consumes and he brings it into a conclusion of the kingdom, he's not coming back as the Lamb of God. He's coming back as the Lion of 
that is coming. We just read from Acts. He's coming to judge the living and the dead. Is everybody tracking what's going on here? So the, the, the unresolved tension for the Jews was that they were expecting the Lion of Judah, and God gave them the Lamb of God. And that's why when you look at situations like England, he, he, here's, here's a conversation that I invite you to, to have as you go to lunch today. L look at me. Here's a conversation. How do you explain if there's a God who loves and is all love and God is so powerful, why will these things happen? Another conversation I'll, I'll invite for you to have with your kids and your grandkids. There is no way that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Isn't doesn't that, that pretty prejudice and exclusivistic? I mean, God has to embrace people. Like, like if you're just, I mean, if you're honest and sincere, that there's no way that your religion is the only religion to. Is everybody tracking on the com Now, I want you to have that conversation because I want you to come back next Sunday and find some of the answers for that conversation. But here's what I will say to you, and this is what the world mandate is crucial, because we do not preach simply that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Look at me for a moment. We preach that God of mercy and love has created a way to heaven. What am I implying? I'm implying that no one should go to heaven because we're all sinners. Does that make sense? You see the tension of the question now? Because the moment that you think that, it's, how do you explain that? Only, it's only Jesus, that's way too radical, that's way too exclusivistic. I'm like, see, you're implying that you deserve to go to heaven. And I want you to look at me for a moment. You and I do not, okay, you and I deserve something. Hell. That's what we deserve. Hell. And by the mercy of God, you are right now in this place, either on your way to heaven or you have the opportunity to embrace life everlasting. But if you are a believer, and see, the reason why you are on your way to heaven is so you can be the catalyst, the person, the family, the church with the power to convey the focus that through the church of Jesus Christ, we are called for this world mandate. Now, let me say one more thing because this is the part that I love before I ask you to pray and pray with me. This is the one part that just blows my mind away. If you remember the Daring Faith series, John chapter 14 and 15 is the conversation between Jesus and the disciples in the upper room. This is the place where Jesus celebrated the Passover. The Passover is a celebration of the people of God departing Egypt into the promised land. And Jesus, in this place of intimacy, we explained this for two months and a half, he took the bread and he broke the bread and said, this is my body broken for you and then jesus took the cup and said this is my blood and is given as a new covenant for you in that moment he takes a towel he actually you know uh, gets a towel and puts it, puts it around his waist he gets a container with water and he goes around the table and washes the disciples feet that's what we're talking about right here upper room in that moment he looks at judas and says whatever you're going to do go ahead and do it now, Judas leaves the place and he betrays Jesus, goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, take Jesus prisoner. They will trial Jesus, beat up Jesus, kill Jesus, bury Jesus, and eventually is resurrected. Once Jesus is resurrected, and once they are empowered with the Holy Spirit, the same cowards, the same hesitant, the same self-centered Jewish people, Jewish men that were so nationalistic, they are transformed by the power of God that they go from the upper room where they were locked up, they were, they were hiding, and they are willing to go into the openness of the palace of the Romans and openly look in defiance to Caesar and says, Caesar is not Lord. Jesus, the one you crucified, is Lord. That blows my mind away. Because I live in a culture, just like you, where if I am a Christian, it's so I can live safely. If I'm a Christian, I should have my dreams being fulfilled. If I'm a Christian, my kids should never fill in the blank. If I'm a Christian, my marriage should never go through. If I'm a Christian, financially, is everybody tracking where I'm going with this? But it seems to me that since or if I am a Christian, we're supposed to go into the open and declare the goodness of this gospel. Yes, I know that those who were brave enough to do the palace, they were decapitated. Yes, I know 
those who went before the governors and the magistrates, those who went before men and women and openly confessed Jesus, they were crucified just like Jesus. Would it be possible that maybe as a church, we begin this conversation by embracing the reality of the gospel? That instead of demanding and expecting for my spouse to do what I think he or she should do, I begin the conversation with this mindset of sacrificial giving. Because he, 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 here's what I know about the story. That the journey of these people is in the context of calamities and confusion. The Jesus, the Jesus person and the testimony and the reputation is so torn apart because the way Jesus went out, the way he was crucified, and, and, and most people are not believing that he is actually a resurrected Christ. See, the journey for them is in the context where within the next few decades, by the year 7070 after Jesus, some of the most radical persecution is going to take place in this time in world history. And out of this persecution and calamity and abuse and massacre and genocide, the gospel explodes and goes to the nations. Because men and women were willing to become, and this is what I want you to look at that, to become witnesses. When Arely and I, we got married, we had a close friend of ours, that, a mutual friend of ours that said, hey, I'm not going to be able to go to your wedding. This is 97, so way before technology exploded and all that thing that we have today. And he said, but here's what I'm going to do for you guys as my gift. He used to work for this rental company, uh, car rental company called Alamo Rent-A-Car. And he said, um, I work in Houston. I'm in Houston. Um, if you guys are willing to come to Houston, I'll give you a free uh, vehicle for a week. And you can take it wherever you want to go. You know, uh, unlimited mileage. So what we did is we prepared and we flew on that uh, Saturday. We got married on Saturday at 12 o'clock. And by 3.43.50, we were in the Harlington Airport. And we flew from Houston, from Harlington into Houston. We picked up the car and we started our journey into Orlando Magic Kingdom to see Brother Mickey. And we drove on that rental vehicle. When, when we got to Orlando and we got to our hotel, I still remember that, this is 1997, there was an intersection, a huge intersection, where this intersection in the corner was the hotel where we stayed, where we spent our honeymoon week. And in that intersection, in the corner, on the grass, right there in that big old busy intersection, there was a sign that was uh, grounded with, with this little, uh, it just handmade with big old letters that said, if you witness, if you were, and if you saw the car accident that took place two days ago, would you please call this number? because we're looking for witnesses in court. So apparently, the accident that took place two days prior to our arrival was being taken into court. I look at the number. This is before cell phones, so I didn't have cell phones. I had calling cards, so before cell phones. That would be foolish of me to look at the sign, dial the number and said, hey, so when is the court meeting? I'll be there. Show up to the court the judge will look at me and say, so sir, give us your testimony. And I will say, well, all that I know about the accident is that there was a sign in there. He will look at me and say, are you an idiot? We need people that witness the accident. Would it be possible? Would it be possible that part of the problem for many of us is that we have never witnessed the power of God? We only read about it. We wait for a preacher to tell us about what God says. Is everybody tracking in here? You can only convey what you have experienced. And I'm inviting you, if you have never experienced the power of Jesus Christ, this is the day that you need to understand that for you to move from a natural born taker into a natural born giver is not so you can save your marriage or your children or the nation or avoid tragedy. It is by the power that comes from Jesus, but you must witness. I will even argue this this morning. I will tell you this, that the result of someone who witnesses the presence of God becomes... Obedient. Obedient. Because he, we read this earlier, he is the judge of the living and the dead. He is in charge of everything. See, today I want to invite you that as you obey and as we continue to obey, our obedience has to be grounded in the one single message. He is Lord. There is no buts. There is no, there is no, uh, you know, little asterisks. There is no, if you just knew my story and what I feel and what I think. I, I've been arguing all this for many, many months now that whatever you feel, I respect that. I hope and, and your feelings work out for you. But this is not about what you feel. This is about what Jesus did. 
that is reflected in what we do. See, today, here's what I want you to just process with me and pray with me as we end our time together. If we're going to be witnesses of the power of God, and therefore we're going to go, and the going is based not so we can avoid the England situation or the Philippine situations or the threats or the unsafe situation in the world, but if we're going to go based on the command given by God, then here's what I want you to see this morning very clearly. That for the Jewish community, as I said earlier, the reality is that they wanted the Lion of Judah. And because God needed for them to experience and witness the work of God through them, and God needed through the Lion of Judah for them to become obedient, and for them to preach a message that is found not in nationalistic heritage or in Jewish culture or ethnicity. This is way beyond that. They needed to embrace the reality that the Lamb of God, which is the first coming of Jesus, Christmas, John the Baptist, here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The love of God, the mercy of God, this reality eventually becomes the consummation. The challenge for the world today, for you and I, here's a challenge, and I want you to have this honest conversation as we pray, is that you may be facing a reality that you don't like. You may be in a place in your life that you're questioning the existence of God, the power of God. You may look at this and you're like, well, I'm here because mama and grandmama told me to be here, but if I was up to me, I wouldn't be here. I mean, this, this Bible thing, I mean, I'm all for this religion thing, but all religions are the same. I mean, if you are struggling with this, and obviously you're struggling in the obedience part, and you're confused about the message, I want you to hear this, that the reality of your life, as painful as it may be, one day the consummation is coming our way. So the way Acts, the book of Acts, is going to help us. And this is the way I want you to think about it. When you look at the scriptures, Acts plays a major role with this. On one side, in the scriptures, in this time in history, you had four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the Gospels basically were primarily written to give us what Jesus did and what Jesus said. That's what the Gospels are for. So when it comes to obedience, obedience is not simply behaving or better, being a better person or being a better husband or whatever. Those things are important. I'm glad you can be and you should be. I should be a better citizen. But obedience is basically taking everything that he said. So I say it. Now look at me. If Jesus didn't say it, I don't say it. That's obedience. Tracking on this one? Obedience is whatever he did based on the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we do. We do. If Jesus didn't do it, it's what? We just don't do it. That's obedience. Tracking? Now, the remaining of the Bible or the New Testament is the other part of the conversation. This is what we call the epistles. This is what Paul wrote and Peter and James, all this. Now, look at me for a second. One of the primary reasons why this was written, which is kind of a, the larger bulk of the New Testament, is because people in this time embraced Jesus, they witnessed, they saw him, they crucified Jesus and they repented and they came to embrace Jesus. But here's the problem. Apparently, throughout history, the gap continued to grow between what Jesus said and did and what Jesus meant over what he said and he did. So what was happening is people were translating and applying the words and the deeds of Jesus based on whatever they wanted to do. Does that sound like church today or culture today? You see, we live in a time and age that if you tell me you're a Christian, or if I tell you I'm a Christian, unfortunately, I'm going to have to define what that means. So are you one of those Christians that goes to church? Or are you one of those Christians that don't go to church? Are you one of those Christians that uh, fill in the blank? Everybody tracking on what I'm saying? Because what we have done and what is happening took place and is taking place is that the person, the works, the, the, the deeds of Jesus are gradually being divorced from what Jesus meant over the things that he said and did. The book of Acts for the next three months 
is going to help us to become the connector between everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus did, and everything that he meant on what he said. So when, not if, but when the trials, the tribulations take place, the promise was that he would be with you always. That no matter what happens, no matter whether the reality is so far away from the consummation and you eagerly desire not the Lamb of God, we need redemption. This world is messed up. My marriage needs a miracle. My children need protection. I need healing. I, I want to make sure that when you face those things and things may not be as conducive as you thought they should be, I want you to be connected not to a better future, not to a better condition, not to simply a better improvement of your reality. I want you to be connected to the character, to the deeds, to the words of Jesus facing the reality of your struggles. Because at the end of the day, the promise and the win is not the avoiding of trials. I told you this before. The win is Jesus. If you get Jesus at the end, that's the win. I don't care what happens. I don't care who wins and who departs and who betrays me and who embraces me. If I can get Jesus at the end, that's the win. And today, I want you to face the connection of that Jesus. Would you pray with me, please?